And in the first dream, he tells his brothers, and, and the dream, in essence, was that his brothers would one day bow down to him. Oh, wait a minute, you're younger than all of us. We're not going to bow down to you. And here's what the text says, they hated him even more. And then he has another dream, another vision from the Lord, and this time it takes it up a notch and the interpretation of this dream is not only would Joseph's brothers one day bow down to him, but his mother and father as the sun and moon in this dream are bowing down to Joseph. And he's not revealing this, I don't believe, from a place of arrogance or look at how great I am, but the Lord has revealed a message to Joseph and he's sharing it with his family. Now to fast forward a bit, you know how the story goes, right? He ends up one day being second in command of all of Egypt, only under Pharaoh. And one day his brothers would come seeking refuge from the famine and they would bow down to him not knowing who their brother was. And later, though his mother was already had already passed, later his father would come and bow down to him. So this is a 17-year-old boy having these dreams. You know what the text says when he told him the second dream? It says they hated him even more. And here you have a young man at the age of 17 who is hardworking and responsible and dependable. And one day his father tells him, they're living there in this region, he tells him, go to this other region. If I remember correctly, they went from Hebron, he was told to go from Hebron to Shechem, and there check on your brothers who are supposed to be watching over the flock. And if you look at the distance between Hebron and Shechem, that's about, and I'm rounding down just to be conservative, that's about 40 miles that he would have traveled on foot or by donkey or camel. His father trusted him at the age of 17 to do this. When he gets there, his brothers are not there. A local person says they've actually moved to a new location. They've moved over, is it Dothan? They moved over to Dothan. In the Bible, if you look at the distance between Shechem and Dothan, that was about, again, rounding down as a conservative estimate of being about 60 miles. And so considering the full length of his journey one way, just to go check on his brothers was about 100 miles that he traveled, demonstrating to me that this is a responsible, hardworking, obedient to his father young man that we're talking about. Now when Joseph had traveled a hundred miles to go and check on his older brothers, the same brothers that hated him, you know the story. They said, oh look, it's our brother Joseph. Let's run and give him a hug and a cold cup of water and let's feed him and let's pamper him. Look at what he did for us. Is that how the story goes? If they don't do that, do they? Or rather, the Bible says that they recognize Joseph from a distance. And they conspired amongst themselves his own brothers. They conspired amongst themselves that, 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 of course, their hatred for him had grown and grown and grown. And they conspire amongst themselves, let us, you know what the text says, right? Let us kill him. We're going to get rid of this little brother of ours. And you probably know the story, how that they were set on killing him. That was the plan, that was the consensus, but thankfully the older brother Reuben spoke up and said, no, 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 we're, we're not going to kill him. I'm going to, let's toss him in a pit, let's let him sit there in the pit, and though the text doesn't say this, kind of what it seems to me could be happening, a possibility is, let's kind of humble him a little bit, let him know he's the youngest, we can do what we want to with him. But the text says Reuben had full intention of bringing bringing him out of that pit, returning him back to his father safely. But while Reuben was away, the brother said, Okay, here's some Ishmaelite travelers. They're going down to Egypt. Let's get rid of, let's not just kill the brother. They were still thinking that way. Let's at least get something out of him. Let's sell him as a slave. And here you have this 17-year-old young man who was obedient to his father, responsible, hardworking, dependable, diligent, he was admirable in every aspect we can think of. There was no reason for him to be punished in any way. And, but we read that his brothers grew in hatred and jealousy toward him, and yet they sold him to these Ishmaelite travelers, and they took him down to a strange land, and he was bought. And he served as a slave. You know, if I look at the life of Joseph and organize it into three categories of at least the portion of his life dealing with his adversity, he experienced the pit of family resentment. 
I don't want to make a lot of application here for just a moment, but you know that relationships are some of the most difficult things that we have to deal with as human beings. Now, relationships can be wonderful, they can be warm, they can be inviting, they can be comforting, they can, they can help in so many ways. After all, it is not good that man should be alone, so God didn't make us to be alone. But yet relationships are messy, are they not? And when you're talking about siblings and mothers and fathers and cousins and aunts and uncles and family, relationships can be quite messy. And some of the greatest heartache that comes to some people is seeing that family doesn't love and act toward one another the way that family should. And yet anybody who has received criticism or, or neglect or hatred from one family member to another, you know there is a certain degree of emotional pain that comes with that. You know, I hear all the time of people saying, my family generally got along, but when mom and dad passed away and now there was an inheritance to split, we just fought and fought and fought. Isn't that a sad story for any family? And here you see Joseph in his first bout of adversity was being in the pit, being in the pit of family resentment. And when he's sold as a slave, you know that he's in the household of Potiphar who is the captain of the guard of Pharaoh. And, and as, as Potiphar is seeming to be, seems to be well-to-do and advanced in status, Joseph is, is there in his house serving as, they, as the household slave. But he was so hardworking, it seems, and of course there's more to do with this than this just his dependableness and responsible nature. The Lord blessed him, the Bible says. The Lord gave him the success and prosperity. But he, I believe what goes along with that, he was so trustworthy and hardworking and dependable, along with God's help, he became head over everything that, that Potiphar possessed. Everything in the house and everything outside the house in the field. And the Bible even uses this statement that, that he trusted uh, Joseph so much with all that he had that, that Potiphar didn't even know the things he possessed. All he knew was the bread that was set on the table before him. That's how much he trusted Joseph. And yet you know that his adversity, that is Joseph, went from being in the pit of family resentment, then it led to the pit of false accusation. You know the story there in, in Genesis 39 how that, that, that Joseph was... I don't know how young he was. At the beginning of this story, he was 17, but he's still considered a young man. Was he 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years of age? But the Bible describes him as being a handsome, fit young man. And he caught the longing eyes of Potiphar's wife. When Potiphar was away, she looked at him in a longing fashion, in a lustful fashion, and she says, lie with me. He refuses. The Bible says she comes to him with these advancements day after day after day, which a lesson there for us is that lust oftentimes can be provoked in what we look at. I think there's a lesson there, don't you? How that in Matthew 5, 28, the Bible, Jesus says, whoever looks at a woman with lustful intent in his heart has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It reminds me of what Job said in the, book of jo in the book of Job. He said, I have made a covenant with my eyes not to even look on a young woman in that sexual way. It's something for us Christians to think about, isn't it? Because, of course, she longed for Joseph, and Joseph denied, does Satan tempt us one day and he's gone? No, he's tempting us day after day after day after day. And the Bible says that Joseph refused, and he refused on a regular basis. And you know the story how that one day Joseph comes along, and she wants to, she's making these advancements, and she's, he finds out that he's in the house with her by himself, and he runs away from that situation. But in the process, she grabs his outer garment, garment and clings to it and uses it as supposed evidence for a false accusation. When the men of the field came in, the Bible says that she said, look, my husband brought in this Hebrew man and he's here to mock us. He tried to lie with me, but I refused and I grabbed his garment and here it is for proof. And when Potiphar gets home, I don't know if he believes the story or not. If he does, then I think based on what I've read, he had every right to see that Joseph was put to death. Maybe there was a degree of doubt in Potiphar's mind, so he cast him in prison. But now Joseph is experiencing hardship of a different kind. Now 
now he's in the pit of false accusation. And you know the story how that he goes into the prison. And he goes into the prison and he quickly wins the trust of the captain of the prison. Maybe God is with him. The Bible says throughout the whole story of Joseph, the Lord is with him, the Lord is with him, the Lord is with him. If there's nothing you hear me say today, church family, hear me say this, and it's biblical. Whatever you're going through in life, know that if you're on the side of the Lord, He's on your side. The Lord is with you. Remember that. That's the story of the, uh, that's the lesson of the story of Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph and, and, and he prospered and he was put in charge of all of the prisoners and everything in the prison. And you remember that there were two men. And by the way, you find this in Genesis 37 and in Genesis 39. And now we move to Genesis 40 and you see that there were two prisoners that were put into that jail cell. And one was the baker and one was the butler of, the, of Pharaoh. And they both had dreams, and Joseph interprets their dreams. And for the baker, that meant that in the process of time, very shortly, he would, his head would be taken off. He'd be killed. And for the butler, he would, serve, uh, he would serve Pharaoh again. And so you see that as Joseph predicted, both of those dreams came true. The only thing that Joseph wanted them to know, one, I do not interpret these dreams of my own power. It's God who's giving me the information. And number two, please remember me, he says to the butler, when you get out of here and you're in good standing with Pharaoh again, remember, remember me kindly. What's the Bible say? Do you remember? That a whole lot of time seemed to pass because the Bible makes this observation that despite being shown favor in the prison by Joseph, the butler forgot. He forgot Joseph. I find that fascinating. How can, it's not just every day someone interprets your dream and it comes true exactly the way it's said. It's not just every day you find that type of help and favor in a prison cell. It's not just every day that someone gives you the hope that your life still has meaning, and yet you're telling me that he just conveniently forgot Joseph? Well, for whatever reason it was, here Joseph, we have nothing to complain or, or criticize Joseph about. He's hated by his brothers. He's thrown into the pit. They wanted to kill him. He's sold as a slave. He's wrongfully accused. He's put in a prison cell and he has been forgotten. He's gone through the pit of family resentment. He's gone through the pit of family accusation. Now he's in the pit of forgotten promises. There's too many husbands and wives who made a promise on that wedding day that they had forgotten in process of time. It doesn't feel good to have promises broken, does it? It doesn't feel good when people take their word back and you trusted them at one point or another. And then we see the rest of the story for sake of summarizing is as simple as this, that Joseph was remembered when Pharaoh finally had a dream. And the butler said, oh, I, I do remember this guy that interpreted my dream back in the day. His name is Joseph. He's a Hebrew. He is taken before Pharaoh. And, he, and you know the rest of the story how that these two dreams represent that there will be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. Joseph's wisdom says, use these seven years of plenty to prepare for the seven years of famine. Well, Pharaoh saw the wisdom in this, elevated Joseph second in charge of all of Egypt, only under him. Joseph was able to save his family, was reunited with his family, offered forgiveness to his brothers, and the rest is history. Here's the message I want you to learn from this. Number one, Joseph was a godly young man who experienced hardship after hardship after hardship, and he did not sit down in that pit that we read of and just complain about how hard his life was. When he got into Potiphar's house, he didn't mope and complain and, and, and cast blame. He just got to work being responsible and dependable and trustworthy. The same is true in the prison. And the Lord was with him every step of the way. A godly man is not exempt from adversity. Godly people, you and I, are not exempt from hard circumstances in life. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Here's the second and much more brief example we will give, but the more meaningful one. That's in the Old Testament. When we get to the New Testament, there is a man that we call Jesus Christ. We call Him Lord. We call Him Savior. 
And the Bible tells the story how that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, that Herod heard that there was a child born that they were going around claiming was the king of the Jews, and Herod tried to kill Jesus. He was only on earth for a short time when Herod tried to kill him. They had to become refugees. They had to go on to run. They had to go down into Egypt. Salvation for the nation of Israel with 70 family members was found in Egypt. Jesus had to find that safety in Egypt as well. Just as the children of Israel would 430 years later come out of Egypt and inhabit the promised land, so Jesus at a certain age would come out of Egypt and be brought up in the town of Nazareth that the prophecy might be fulfilled. He was called a Nazarene. Jesus came to this earth taking the form of human and He was sought after to be killed from nearly day one. And yet you fast forward to John 1 and verse number 11. The Bible says He came to His own, the Jewish people, and His own did not receive Him. And you read the story of Jesus' life, how that the Pharisees and Sadducees and Jewish leaders followed Him around, criticizing Him, testing Him, wanting to kill Him. And then we read the story how that one of his own, Judas Iscariot, in process of time, betrayed his Lord for 30 pieces of silver. And then you see that he, he predicts that Peter, one of the, the, the chief apostles, would deny him three times in an evening. And when he was finally illegally captured and illegally tried when he was led to the place called Golgotha to be crucified on a Roman cross, where did his closest friends go? They scattered like a bunch of cowards, with the exception of John, of course. And so Jesus understood hardship. He was beaten. He was betrayed. He was denied. He was killed there upon the cross. Jesus was well acquainted with the difficulties of being a human in this old world. The Hebrews writer says that's one reason He can be our mediator. He knows what it's like to be God and He knows what it's like to be man. And when I am just heartbroken and, and adversity comes over me so that I don't know how to handle it, Jesus knows what that feels like, folks. He knows what that feels like. He was tempted in all points like is we, yet without sin. I want you as we conclude this lesson to turn to two New Testament passages and make some final observations. Turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse number 8. I'm looking at this passage because I hopefully have made the point that godly people are not exempt from hardships. That those of us in Christ have all the blessings that that entails being in Christ, but we still must endure hardships and adversity in this life. So when adversity meets us, how are we to respond and what are we to take comfort in? In 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9, notice what the Bible says. Paul writing to a group of Christians that had seen more than their fair share of problems. He says in 2 Corinthians 4, beginning at verse 8, these words. He says, We are hard pressed on every side, yet we are not crushed. We are perplexed, yet we are not in despair. Verse 9, we are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. Question, anywhere in this passage does Paul deny the reality of hardships? He does the opposite, doesn't he? He freely admits that as Christians, we will be hard-pressed. Or the King James says, we will be troubled. The English Standard says, we will be afflicted. But though we are afflicted, notice what he says, we will not be crushed. I take comfort in that. In essence, Paul is saying, get ready. Put your boots on. Get ready to stand and fight because hardships are inevitable, but just take comfort in this. Though you will feel the discomfort of the hardship, God will not allow that hardship to crush us. I take comfort in that, don't you? Oh, it feels like it sometimes, doesn't it? It feels as though the weight of this world is always upon us. You know, the more through my own life and through ministry with others, here's what I know is people carry around adversity everywhere they go and often suffer in silence. Depression, anxiety, 
neuroticism, and I'm not saying neuroticism is a word meaning negative emotions. Always having that voice inside the head, inside the mind, thinking you're not good enough. They don't love you. It's too hard. Give up. You're too weak. Don't we all experience that? That sometimes feels crushing, but the Bible says we might be hard-pressed. The word hard-pressed paints this picture to me as though the difficulties of this life are pushing in on me from the front, from the sides, from the back, from the bottom, from the top. And like some of those movies I've seen before of the walls closing in and you wonder, what can I do now? God says it might put on the pressure, but you will not be allowed to be crushed. Thank you, Lord, for not letting me be crushed. The passage continues by saying we may be perplexed. And I love that he put this here, God in His inspired wisdom, because perplexed carries with it the idea of not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. We can't see a way of escape. We can't see another way other than the suffering we're currently going through. There might be moments when we think, God, I know that You've got me, but I just don't see how this gets better. Lord, I know that You've got me. I believe that with all my heart, but I just cannot see any light. It all seems like darkness going forward. And for that reason, people are committing suicide at a higher rate than we have seen before in these United States of America. We may be perplexed. What's the text say? Yet we will not be left in despair. This idea of left in despair carries with it the idea we will not be in a situation of total loss. Even if we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, had faith that the, the end is near. That there is better days ahead. Just like if I'm up on a bluff and I'm watching the waves of the ocean come in and the tide, as sure as those tides come in, that's just as sure as they will go out again. Difficulties will arise, but they will subside, is what the Bible would teach. He says you might be persecuted, but you are not forsaken. I love that he says this. This idea of forsaken means you will not be left behind. There are people that hate you. Jesus says they hated me, they're going to hate you. There are people who want to see you suffer. There are people who are jealous of you. They envy you and they don't want to see you succeed. They're rooting against you. But the Bible says, but don't think you're going at it all alone. Don't think that I've left you. I Don't think that I've abandoned you. I'm still there. I will never leave you nor forsake you, the Scripture says. And then he says that you might be struck down. You might receive a blow from this old world that knocks you to your knees. What's he say next? Yet you will not be destroyed. You can get back up. You can keep on going. The fight is not over. You will not be left to be destroyed. Here's the second passage. It's 1 Peter chapter 5. And we'll end on this passage. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 10, notice what Peter says here that might give us some comfort and direction in moments of adversity. He says in 1 Peter 5 and verse number 10 these words. He says, But may the God of all grace who called us to His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, notice, may He perfect you, may He establish you, may He strengthen you, and may He settle you. Let's talk about each of those words briefly. When the Bible says that God of all peace in the moment of our suffering and thereafter, He will perfect us. If you look at the Greek meaning of this, the best that I can tell, it's the idea He will repair you. My heart is broken. I've lost someone dear to me. The Lord will repair you. The Lord will repair you. I have lost trust because the person who committed themselves to me for life has cheated on me, abandoned me, or not treated me with the love they promised. That heart that heart, that brokenness of heart is real, but the Lord will repair us. And then he says that he will settle you. He will settle you, and along with this, establish. This idea of settle means that he will give you a firm foundation on which to stand on. When you're in the midst of suffering, you feel as though the walls are closing in. 
You feel as though the floor is falling beneath you. You feel as though you're falling in utter darkness. But the Bible says He will not only repair your heart, but He will give you solid ground to stand on in the midst of our struggles. The Bible says in James chapter 1 that if when we are going through struggles, we can't find the joy nor see the light at the end of the tunnel, in that moment pray. Pray for wisdom that God will allow us to see the way out. I don't know what you're going through right now. Maybe everything's fine and dandy. Here's a reality. Maybe it is fine and dandy. Two observations. It won't always be that way because life is not a continual walk in the park. And you've got brothers and sisters in Christ and family members who may be suffering. Equip yourself to go help them. Weep with those who weep as well as rejoice with those who rejoice. Maybe you're here and you say, my problem is small compared to so many. We could all say that. But those small problems that you know full well plague your mind and disturb your heart, know that God's got you. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and follow Him and receive the comfort that is attached to that. Will you obey Jesus with faith, repentance, confession, and baptism? And will you come and take Him as your Savior? as we stand and as we sing. Thank you so much for being here today. We normally like to ask at the close of our service, if you will, look in the pew back in front of you and fill out one of those cards. There is a member side and a visitor side. Ryan has already asked you to do that at the beginning of service. This is just a reminder. And once you've filled that out so that we can have a record of your attendance, can you please pass that to the inside aisles so that we can have gentlemen come by and take those up. Thank you for working with us on that. Uh, let me once again just say what Ryan has already stated, and that is that one week from today, we will be having another guest speaker, Rob Whitaker, who will be kicking our uh, evangelism seminar off on our regular service times on Sunday. He will be here to teach, and I believe we're going to do the fifth grade and up here in the adult class this coming Sunday. So if you're a teacher and you're a child in the fifth grade and up, know that you'll be coming in the adult class the auditorium classroom, Rob will be teaching that session. He'll be preaching that morning. He'll be preaching that evening. And then on Monday, 6.30 will be a lesson. 
at, and in the evening, and 7.30 will be a second lesson. And then the event will be concluded on Tuesday. He'll have one lesson starting at 6.30. And on the Tuesday lesson, men will be broken up in, and women for, into separate classes, and his wife will be teaching the women, and he, and he will be concluding with the men. So we want you to come and be a part of that. This is not a training class for 10% of the congregation who are interested in doing Bible studies. This is a class for all Christians that we may get deeper insights and motivation into sharing the good news of Jesus with others. So we hope to have the majority of our members here for that. We hope that you will take advantage of this because we actually lucked up to get him here. It was going to be a two or more year wait, but because he was on his way to Florida School of Preaching, we got him in much quicker. We hope you'll take advantage of that. Um, don't forget we have our Old Testament Bible reading plan this week. We're reading Exodus, uh, starting the book of Exodus chapter 2, uh, five chapters. And don't forget to take those invitation cards that so many of you are used to using. And let's start the evangelism with something as simple as saying, hey, come to church with me. I'd love to have you as a guest. Um, I don't have any other announcements, but we have a closing song and a closing prayer. Hope to see you this evening at 6 p.m. Number 392, please. This will be our closing hymn. 392, please. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. If the skies are Thank you.